So in this lecture, I'm going to take you through the pupil identities and subcultures topic. And this leads on from the roles and processes lecture that you've already had, where we looked at labelling and the labelling process, um, as well as in class and, and in school groupings. So what we're going to look at really is the impact of those groupings and the labelling process and how they can help form subcultures um, and lead students into memberships of both pro-school and anti-school subcultures. And we're going to look at how um, these processes can shape pupil identities. Now, what we mean by pupil identities is um, how a student sees themselves as a student. And that can link into who they see themselves as as a person um, and can follow them throughout the rest of their lives. For example, being in a um, low set in maths, for example, someone might describe themselves as being bad at maths and that can follow them through the or become part of their um, personal identity as they continue throughout the rest of their life. Um, and there are lots of adults who um, often say, oh, I'm just really bad at maths. I was never any good at maths. Um, but that can apply to any subject, really. Personally, really bad at art. I have absolutely no talent at art whatsoever. Um, and part of that comes from the um, processes and roles in schools when my art teacher told me that he would quit if I took GCSE art. Um, I had no intention of taking GCSE art, by the way, um, and he was a family friend, so it wasn't quite as bad as it sounds. But this, these people identities and, this, and these subcultures link in quite nicely as a synoptic link to um, Goffman's looking glass self. I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. So in terms of education, what we're seeing there is that um, students formulate their identity as a pupil, who, how, who they are, how, what they're good at, what they're not good at, whether they're a good student, high achiever, low achiever, sporty, whatever, through the labels that are attached to them and which then goes on to shape their belief about them as a student. So we're going to start off by looking at the work of Colin Lacey in the 1970s and he was talking about how one of the responses to the labelling that occurs and remember this labelling is generally unconscious, it's not something that is um, deliberate, we don't sit around with a sorting hat type thing. Um, but a response to the labelling process can be the creation of pupil subcultures. Now, we're not talking cliques here, like in the American TV shows and movies and things like that, where you have your jocks and you have your um, academically able, your band geeks and, and things like that. We're talking more about um, pro and anti-school subcultures. And Colin Lacey suggested that there are two factors that help create pupil subcultures from the labelling. The first he talks about is differentiation. And what he means here is, is the process of teachers categorising pupils according to ability, attitude or behaviour. So how you are organised within school. So linking back to those ideas of in school grouping, setting, streaming, in class groupings, mixed ability groupings, whether you're middle, whether you're considered to be one of the students who is a glider. So they just get on and carry through. They don't stand out for excellence. They don't stand out for poor behaviour. But he's talking about that separation of students into different groupings. That along with um, polarization, which is where he's talking about the process in which students respond to the streaming, uh, the setting, the um, groupings um, and that differentiation um, leads them to move towards one or, or more 
polar opposites or extremes. So this is where we're talking about um, pro and anti-school subcultures. Now, there are lots of students who don't go into either of these groups. They don't become pro school. They don't become anti school. They just kind of without sounding harsh, they exist. They, they make their way through the school system. And again, I, I would refer to these people as the gliders, those who um, don't stand out for good, don't stand out for bad. They're just they turn up, they do the job, they go home, they get the grades, they, they get what's expected of them. And they just kind of glide through the education system. But there are those who go to the extreme and we get, end up with those who are pro school and those that are so anti school. So if we look at these two different um, subcultures, these two main subcultures in school, we'll start with the pro school subculture. So these are the students who stand out for excellence. Um, they they're committed to the school values. So in the case of Wyndham College, they're committed to the pride, positivity and passion ethos that is part of the school. They get their status and their um, standing in school through academic achievers, people who get excellent grades. They're your A's and your A stars, your nines, your eights and nines type students or they might not perhaps get the best grades, but they're what called new enterprises. So they are more involved in the wider life of the school. They're on the school council. They play in school um, bands and orchestra or teams, sports teams, football, rugby, hockey, netball. Um, they may be all of these things. They may be that person that is just, you really want to dislike, but you can't because they're good at school, they're good at get good grades, they're in top sets, they're on the school council, they ha um, are in the drama club, they get the lead in the school play, they're in the orchestra, they play on the hockey team, they're in the first teams, and they're there on open events and they're always volunteering and things like that, but they're really nice people. So th they're not... Um, arrogant with it they're just kind of they enjoy these things so that they they get their status they get their approval through being an active and involved member of the school at the other end of the spectrum we have the anti-school subculture and these are very much the antithesis antithesis something like that, um, of the pro-school subculture. So they reject school values. They tend to have low attendance. They're disruptive. They don't do their homework. Their uniform is never quite right. Um, they gain their approval, their friendship approval through challenging and disruptive behavior. They're the ones that call out inappropriately during lessons. Um, or try to embarrass teachers. They're the ones who mess around mostly with a supply teacher because they think they can get away with it. Um, they make it clear, very, very clear, that they don't want to be at school, that they don't want to be there. They don't see the point in putting effort into their studies, that they have a plan and it, it doesn't involve getting the top grades. Uh, and these students are the ones who can be at risk of exclusion and can be at risk of um, underachieving in their education. So what we're seeing here is when that labelling occurs, if there is a negative label that is attached, as we saw in the previous lesson and lecture, then they, if they internalise that, I'm a bad student, I'm disruptive, I'm troublesome, I'm low academic ability, that can lead to an anti-school subculture. Whereas if a positive label is attached, you're really good at this, you, you've worked hard, you're, um, a, you're the sort of person we want in the school photographs for publication and, and things like that, that can lead to a pro-school subculture. And both of these subcultures link to academic achievement. Now we're going to look specifically at academic achievement in the next section 
um, and we'll look at gender, ethnicity and social class. But joining these subcultures because of the way that you gain your kudos, gain your status within education, within your peer group, within the school, it links to academic achievement. Being in an anti-school subculture, low academic achievement is seen as desirable. It's kind of like, yeah, look, I don't care. I, I got really bad grades and I really don't care. Whereas a pro-school subculture, anything below the top grade is disappointing. And that can have its own problems, definitely. But in terms of overall academic achievement, we do see higher academic achievement from those who subscribe to a pro-school subculture and underachieving by those who are of an anti-school subculture. Okay. However, we need to remember that this is not a guaranteed process. And there are studies that show that negative labeling doesn't always lead to underachievement or an anti-school subculture. For example, Margaret Fuller's study in 1984 of black girls in a London comprehensive found that, oft, that quite often within this um, ethnic group, when which are labelled negatively, possibly as loud and aggressive and um, underachieving, instead of accepting that label and and kind of going, oh well, I'm, I'm not particularly able, so. If I don't do well, well, so be it. In fact, these girls um, rejected it and were kind of like a sod you, I'm going to prove you wrong mentality. And they knuckled down and they studied hard and they because they wanted to prove their teachers wrong. They wanted to prove the school wrong, who said that they weren't capable or they weren't able. Instead, they went completely the other way and was sort of like, I am going to do well. So they still formed a slight anti-school subculture but rather than that anti-school subculture um, leading to underachievement it actually led to academic achievement and, and excellence and Mackengahil and I'm probably mispronouncing that again um, pointed out that the pro and anti-school subculture dynamics that is is too simplistic and that there can be um, a multitude of pro and anti-school subcultures that vary in the levels of their um, anti or pro-school approach. Um, for example, he identifies the macho lads. These are um, students who are aggressively anti-school. They they are aggressive towards teachers, they are argumentative, but he also um, identifies the um, new enterprises who are not as, they're not pro-school in the sense of uh, academic excellence, but they're, they are proving themselves through more vocational um, qualifications and more vocational routes to success so they may not fit the academic um, pro school elements that we would traditionally associate with a pro school subculture they're creating their own way to excellence which is still pro school but not as pro school as say the um, students who that we described as the in the binary pro school subculture and Davis also points out that with girls, their anti-school subculture tends to be less aggressive than the masculine and doesn't fit with the dynamic that we described in um, the previous slide of being truanting and disruptive in lessons and um, not doing homework and, and things like that. Their anti-school subculture tends to be more feminized and, and um, overtly feminine where they are more concerned 
about romance and finding a husband or a partner and having children they don't need academic qualifications because they're going to have somebody look after them and as long as they look pretty and things like that so again they're still anti-school but it's far more complex than that binary suggestion that's put forward by Lacey okay other criticisms that there are of the labelling leading to um, subcultures is the is the fact that it is deterministic. It's deterministic because it's saying that the label that is attached causes the um, membership to the subculture. So it's kind of taking away that choice, that um, freedom of a student that Margaret Fuller points out and kind of says, well, they can reject the label if they choose to it also ignores the or over um exaggerates teacher agency the the autonomous power of teachers to influence and affect students um sociologists might point out that um schools themselves encourage teachers to label students through things like target grades we, we are when we are given data on students at the beginning of the year, when we're given your target grades, it tells us who are our A grade students, who are our C grade students, who are our D grade students. And it, the, it's almost like um, schools encourage teachers to label students. Um, and it kind of suggests that as teachers, we're actively participating in this process now personally i don't like target grades i think they're pointless and there is no reason for you to know them um they they're only useful after the exams when we're looking at the amount of progress you have made and whether or not you've made adequate progress but throughout the course as a kind of measuring stick it doesn't quite work for me. So this this idea of teacher agency that we have this power to um, to push you one way or the other is quite over exaggerated. And finally, there have been changes in education, and we did talk about this last lesson: the changes in um, labeling uh, in teacher training, where teachers are made aware of unconscious biases and aware of the labeling process and i know for myself that the more i've taught about labeling and the more i've taught about the this kind of area of sociology the more i reflect on my own practice and kind of go i need to stop doing x or i need to stop do x, doing y because those things are labeling the students which Yes, it could have a positive effect, but it could also have a negative effect. And maybe I'm over exaggerating my own power of um, labelling or, or, or my own power over um, student um, attitudes. But at the same time, there is that element there. If you're constantly told, if you're told something enough times, you start to believe it is true. And I can't remember where the quote comes from, but one of, another of my favourite quotes is, if you believe something to be true, you will behave as if it is true. And that can go both, both ways in terms of positive and negative. So if we now move on to look at how schools shape pupil identities. Now, just as a reminder, when we're talking about pupil identities, we're talking about how people see themselves as a student, how they see themselves as a learner. And this identity can follow somebody through beyond the 18 or however long they are in education and can still be shaping how somebody sees themselves many years after they have actually left school. So what we're going to look at is um, the processes and the factors that within schools that help to shape and formulate these ideas about who we are as a pupil and as a learner. So the first one we're going to talk about is symbolic capital. Now, this refers to your status, recognition and sense of worth that is given to you from others. So it's not about self-worth. It's how others 
see you. And again, linking into Goffman's idea of the looking glass self. And it tends to be very much policed by peer groups. And um, for example, male and female peer groups really tend to reinforce gender appropriate behaviour and punish behaviour that's seen as belonging to the opposite gender. Um, and it can reinforce um, loyalty to that group and can reinforce certain behaviours in terms of um, academic achievement. So, for example, Archer um, talks about how working class girls gain symbolic capital from their peers by um, fitting in to a hyper heterosexualized feminine identity um which is which means that they construct um a view of themselves that is very much linked to clothing and makeup and being looking certain ways and behaving in certain ways um, looking more at trying to get a boyfriend than perhaps getting a good grade and this kind of hyper heterosexualized feminine identity puts students at uh, or puts some girls at co um, in conflict with the school system which can then be because they're getting their status from their friends through the way that they look, the way that they dress, rather than um, being seen as academically able. Um, and this is, or Archer suggests that um, this can bring girls into more conflict with schools due to teachers seeing the preoccupation with appearance as a distraction from learning. And you tend to see that girls who, in, who are engaging in this um, sim, or trying to gain this symbolic capital, breaking school appearance rules, wearing jewellery, wearing makeup, short skirts, um, low cut tops, um, things like that. Um, and Larcher also referred to this as othering and labelling girls as incapable or these these particular girls as incapable of educational success. Um, and that links into our second point, which is symbolic violence. And this term is, comes from Bordeaux and refers to um, not physical violence, but um, the, the way that certain groups ad, have an advantage over others. And that advantaged group, the, the, the higher status group, make the others feel inferior. Um, and Archer uh, linked this to what he um, what she referred to as um, the Nike culture or the Nike identity, where symbolic capital comes from the labels that you wear. Um, this is then seen within the education system, which is um, obviously more middle class as seen as inferior and as um, worthless and the, the culturally worthless. So it gives the impression that these, um, that the subculture, the, the working class subculture, the hyper heterosexualized feminine subculture, the anti-school subculture, that they are all inferior and incapable of educational success, which can shape the view that I'm no good at school, therefore I'm, I, there's no point, okay? Um, and 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 this is this this view of education, this view of learning. I'm no good at learning. Can follow people f from on can, from education into later life. We've also got the role of the school environment, and this is the work of um, Ray and. Again, looking at working, he was looking at working class students. Um, they, the way that the school presents itself through its um, public um, pu publicity materials, the way that it advertises itself, it can put people off 
going there because they don't see see themselves as worthy so they're kind of unworthy of attending high achieving schools and only see themselves as good enough as attending poor schools the school is poor therefore they must be bad students therefore um they're no good at education okay so this idea that um students who go to a less um what's the word i'm looking for less i don't want to say less good that's really bad grammar um, but uh schools that aren't quite perhaps getting the grades or are not quite as high up in the league tables must mean that the school's not very good and if i go to that school then i can't be a very good student so therefore i must not be very good at learning and again that that idea can follow through we also then need to look at the ethnocentric curriculum and what that means is it's a curriculum that focuses on a particular culture or a particular ethnic group so in the uk and the ethnocentric curriculum focuses very much on british history on british culture and reinforcing that culture and this was referred to by ball as being little englandism where ethnic minority groups feel rejected by the education system because the education system is very much based around Br being british british history um the other areas of school such as the school calendar is linked to christian holidays easter and christmas the type of meals that we get tend to be very much of british um cultural foods um and um uniforms that don't necessarily allow for cultural variations such as hijabs or um longer skirts and and things like that and this suggest and ball suggests that this kind of little englandism or this ethnocentric curriculum suggests to ethnic minority students that they are not worthy of education that they're not able and when they're not able to relate to the curriculum it's not because of cultural differences which is the actual cause but because they're not as intelligent that they're not as good a learner okay now remember we are talking quite in, in quite big generalizations here and things are changing but that idea that, that that ethnocentric curriculum can can convince somebody that perhaps they're not a good student because they can't relate to what is being discussed they can't relate to um the history that's being taught or the re or the um, english literature and and things like that so it can lead them to believe that because i can't access this i must not be as good a student i must not be intelligent rather than i did not have it or um it being culturally specific okay we can also look at sub subject choice and how students choices of subject at gcse and a level can reinforce gender stereotypes and reinforce gender identities such as girls taking um more what are referred to as expressive subjects english drama music sociology and boys taking more instrumental ones um which links back to our the, our work in family in terms of being more practical computer science technology law history politics they tend to be more um masculine in their um numbers of students and this can reinforce that idea of what it means to be masculine what it means to be feminine in terms of who you how you see yourself as a student uh, I, or um, how you see yourself as a person and what you're supposed to be like as a person now as we've said before things are changing and there is more um gender neutral um approaches to subject choice and we've got things like gist girls in science and technology and wise women in science and engineering to kind of push 
girls in that way and we've got role models of um famous actors and and um musicians and hairdressers and chefs and things like that that kind of um show that boys and men can go into those sort of subjects uniforms uniforms again link to the, those ideas of gender identity and um shaping that gender identity in terms of the standards of dress boys tend to have a very a particularly a level and, and you can even look at it in Wyndham college where the boys uniform or the, the uniform coat dress code is very straightforward tie shirt jacket smart um suit trouser and jacket and smart shoes girls have more um choice to them but they're also then more high, um heavily policed in skirt length um necklines what sort of sleeves they've got if they've uh, strap um strappy tops spaghetti syringe tops or sleeveless and things like that but it links to that idea of this means what this is means you're being fem uh, to be feminine and this is what it means to be masculine um and when students don't um follow those those standards of dress they're punished for it um if girls are and and again this can link into that idea of um symbolic violence that if you don't live up to the higher status standards of dress then you are punished for it you you are made to feel less than because of it we have already talked about subcultures and the idea of the working class uh, sorry the um anti-school and pro-school subcultures um and how they can shape um a student's identity in terms of symbolic capital and creating their where their sense of worth and where their sense of worth comes from with fuller and willis all showing us how those subcultures link into that sense of symbolic um capital and that idea of what who you are and who how you are going to gain status amongst your peer group or within the school and labeling positive we, we've already talked about this but positive and negative labeling the impact it has on self-esteem and self-image a student that is labeled negatively may assume that academic success is beyond them somebody who is labeled positively might look at academic success as being more within their grasp so overall what we're seeing is that the the process roles and processes in schools the uniforms the um, hidden curriculum the labeling the groupings all of these things can create pro and anti-school subcultures it can also help form a student to formulate who they want to be as a learner are they going are they academic achievers are they pro school are they underachievers are is school not worth their time okay so that is what we mean when we're talking about pupil identities and subcultures